Hi everyone and welcome to today's session. Today we are going to look at a very common intestinal parasite called Enterobius vermicularis, which is known by the common name pinworm or threadworm. The word enterin is from Greek, meaning intestine, and bias refers to life, while vermiculus is a Latin word that means a small worm or worm-like. So, the name Enterobius vermicularis refers to tiny worms living in the intestine, while enterobiosis is the medical condition associated with pinworm infestation. Here we have a clip that demonstrates living pinworms. You can see here, several small thread-like worms that are moving about. Usually, these worms don't cause any harm, other than the irritations from itching and sometimes restless sleep. Enterobius vermicularis was formerly called Oxyurus vermicularis, for which the word Oxyurus means sharp tail, as you can see on the image on the right bottom. This pointed part here, it is a feature of the female worm, and it is from this the name pinworm is also derived. Now you might be wondering, where do these pinworms infest? Or where exactly are they found in the human body? Just like other nematodes, the main site of infestation is the alimentary canal, or the digestive tract especially the large intestine. Here is an image that shows the parts of the digestive tracts. This larger outer pinkish part is the large intestine, where the adult's worms are located. The first area is this part pointed with a red arrow which is the cecum. The other area where pinworms are found is at this finger-like, blind-ended tube connected to the cecum, at the junction of the small intestine and large intestine. It is the appendix and it is this organ here pointed with a green arrow. And other common part is the adjacent portion of ascending colon that is pointed by the blue arrow in this image. Pinworms will normally remain attached in any of these parts of the large intestine by their mouth end. Enterobiosis is worldwide in distribution and often occurs in children. This is mostly in school-age children between the age of 5 and 14 years. Overcrowding, poor hygiene and personal care are usually the promoting factors for the infection. Other people who are at risk for the infection include institutionalized persons, household members of people infected with pinworms, and child care centers. We'll briefly have a look at the morphology of the adult worm, both male and female, and the eggs. The adults are short, white, thin, and fusiform worms. Fusiform refers to the shape, meaning having a spindle-like shape that is wide in the middle and tapers at both ends, as shown in the image to the left. The pointed ends look like bits of white thread. The mouth is surrounded by three wing-like cuticular expansions, known as cervical elite, and they are transversely striated. It has a bulb-shaped esophagus with a double bulb structure. When you look at this image here, the esophagus is this double bulb structure that is dark brown in color at upper half of the worm. This double bulb is formed by the posterior end of the esophagus, which is dilated to form a globular bulb. It's a unique feature to pinworms. In this image here, we have the female pinworm, which is usually larger than the male worm, measuring approximately 8 to 13 millimeters long and 0 to 0 0.5 millimeters thick. Its posterior third is tapering, straight, thin and pointed with pin-like tail. When the female is gravid, almost the whole body is filled by the distended uteri carrying thousands of eggs. When you look at this image, it shows a female worm that is pregnant, and these numerous small structures are the eggs. Pinworms are oviparous. Oviparous means that the female worm produces eggs that develop and hatch outside the body. The lifespan of female pinworms is between 5 to 12 weeks. Here we have the male worm that is smaller, measuring about 2 to 5 millimeters long and 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters wide. The posterior one-third is tightly curved ventrally and carries a copulatory spicule. The male pinworms die soon after fertilization, and their lifespan is about 7 to 8 weeks. The eggs can be oval or D-shaped. The shell is thick and the egg contains a fully formed tadpole-shaped coiled embryo. These eggs can become infectious six hours after being deposited on the perianal skin, and they can remain viable for about two weeks if they are maintained under cool, moist conditions. One of the ways the parasite is spread is through auto-infection. This is direct infection of a patient mostly via fecal-oral route. Usually, the parasite will cause intense itching of the perianal area. This will force the patient to scratch the perianal area with fingers leading to deposition of eggs under the nails. It happens mostly in children when they acquire the infection after ingesting embryonated eggs containing larvae through contaminated fingers or when nail biting. Retroinfection is the other way through which the infection is spread. Basically, what happens in retroinfection is that the eggs laid on the perianal skin immediately hatch into the infective stage larva and migrate through the anus to develop into worms in the colon. There is retrograde migration of the infection from anus to the colon. And rarely, the infection is acquired by inhalation of the airborne eggs. 
The life cycle of Enterobius vermicularis is not complicated and is so easy to understand. We'll go through each stage, step by step. Humans are the only host of the parasite. It has no intermediate host and does not undergo any systemic migration. Initially, the infection is acquired through ingesting embryonated eggs containing larvae often by contaminated fingers or even via inhalation. These eggs containing infective larvae are swallowed and moved to the intestines where they hatch out. While in the intestines, they molt in the ileum and enter the cecum, where they mature into adults. Essentially, it takes anywhere between two weeks to two months from the time the eggs were ingested to the development to an adult female that is ready to lay eggs. When the female is ready to lay eggs, it migrates down the colon to the rectum. By night when the patient is sleeping, the worm comes out through the anus and migrates to the perineal skin to lay its sticky eggs. During the day it may retreat into the anal canal and come out again at night to lay more eggs. In the female patient, the parasite may move into the vulva, vagina and even into the uterus and fallopian tubes, sometimes reaching the peritoneum. Male worm dies after mating and is passed in the feces, hence it is rarely seen. After laying all the eggs, the female worm dies as well. The activity of the female worm while it lays and crawls about the perianal region is what causes the pruritus, or intense itching and scratching by the patient. The scratching will transfer the infective eggs on the fingernails or under the fingernails and ingested by the host leading to auto-infection. And because of this auto-infection, the cycle continues. The clinical features, or the symptoms manifest as intense irritation and pruritus of the perianal and perineal area, which coincides with the female worm that crawls out of the anus to lay eggs at night. This itching is known as pruritus ani, and often leads to scratching and excoriation of the skin around the anus. This scratching can also cause bacterial superinfection. Superinfection is when skin infections develop after bacteria enter through small breaks in the skin that result from scrapes or scratching. In female patients, the worms may crawl into the vulva and vagina causing irritation. It may migrate up to the uterus and fallopian tubes. This may cause symptoms of cervicitis and chronic salpingitis. The irritation often leads to sleep disturbance. Nocturnal enuresis may occur. The worms may obstruct the appendix causing appendicitis. It has been found in surgically removed appendix. In severe infections, abdominal pain and weight loss may occur. Diagnosis is made by identifying the worm or its eggs. History of perianal itching strongly suggests pinworm infection. Perianal swab can be done using the scotch tape method that involves using an adhesive transparent cellophane tape. The tape is mounted on a wooden tongue depressor with the sticky side held out. Then it is firmly pressed against the anal margin after which the tape is transferred to a glass slide and examined under the microscope. The adult worms may sometimes be noticed on the surface of stools. They may be detected in stools collected after an enema, and may be in the appendix during a pendectomy. Sometimes, in infected children the eggs may be demonstrated in the dirt collected from beneath the fingernails. Eggs are rarely seen in feces, so fecal examination is not useful in diagnosis. Enterobiosis is treated with an oral antiparasitic medication that kills the worms completely after two doses. One of the following drugs can be given. Mebendazole, albendazole, or parental pamote. The same treatment should be repeated after two weeks to kill worms that might have hatched from eggs ingested following initial treatment. Treatment of household members is advocated to eliminate asymptomatic reservoirs of potential reinfection. Some drugs like parental pamote have side effects that needs to be looked out for and they include headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. One of the factors that undermine the control of pinworm infection is reinfection. So strict adherence to good hand hygiene is important. Adequate hand washing, ensuring that fingernails are kept clean and short, refraining from nail biting and avoiding scratching the perianal area are some of the ways pinworms can be prevented. Complications from having pinworms are rare, but they can occur, and they include Bacterial infections It is possible for bleeding and infection to occur when the sick person scratches the anal area. In females, the worms can travel to the vagina and cause urinary tract infections. And in rare cases, appendicitis can occur. Pinworms don't pose long-term health problems when properly treated. However, they can recur often in children or families. Practicing simple hygiene measures such as showering every day and frequently washing towels, sheets, and underwears will ensure the infection is controlled. And that will be the end of this video. Thank you for watching.